الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة واتم التسليم على شرف الأنبياء سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون الإمام النعمان بن ثابت الكوفي رحمة الله عليه whose name is fragrance on our mouths and hearing his name is something that pleases the heart Al-Imam Al-Nu'man bin Thabit known famously as Al-Imam Abu Hanifa so whenever people hear the name of the Imam uh, the kunya, the agnomen of the Imam Abu Hanifa the person who hears the name will become happy and this is why some of the scholars they said that the person who is happy with Abu Hanifa Rahimallah is from Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah and the one who despises Abu Hanifa is from the Ahlul Bid'ah, the people of innovation. Now they said this for a reason, but what was the life and legacy of Al Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man bin Thabit Rahmatullahi Ali? Al Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimallah Ta'ala was mostly renowned for Al Fiqh, jurisprudence, meaning if people discuss his legacy, for the main part, he is known for jurisprudence. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was born in Al-Kufa and in the year 80 after Hijri. So 80 years after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated from Mecca al-Mukarramah to al Madina to al-Munawbarah, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was born. His full name, Al-Nu'man bin Thabit bin Zawta or bin Zuta, because his ancestors were Persian and he was from a Persian descent. His ancestors came originally from the city of Kabul in Af modern day Afghanistan and then they moved to different regions, to Nasa, to Tirmid, all of these areas are in Central Asia until they settled down in Al Kufa. And Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was born in Al-Kufa. His father, Thabit, it is related regarding him. He went to Sayyiduna Ali, Karamallahu wajahu al-Kareem, and Sayyiduna Ali, Karamallahu wajahu al-Kareem, supplicated for his offspring. So the result of that supplication is Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. That the overwhelming number of Muslims that follow Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah in Al-Furu' in subsidiary issue, issues of Al-Fiqh jurisprudence is the result of the supplication of Sayyiduna Ali karamallahu wajahu al-kareem. And of course, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala had strong ties with the descendants of Sayyiduna Ali karamallahu wajahu al-kareem. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, the name Hanifa was most likely not given to him because of a daughter. The name Hanifa comes from Hanafa. Hanafa is to turn away from something. So when someone turns away from Batil, when they turn away from falsehood and they turn towards the truth, this is known as Al Hanif. This is why Al Islam is known as Adin Al Hanif. So the kunya, the agnomen of Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah, Al Imam Abu Hanifa. The, the Hanifa, the title Hanifa means someone who does not embark upon falsehood. Someone who turns towards the truth. And then the name of Nu'man, we know that the word Ni'ma means the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nu'man is one of the forms in the Arabic language of Ni'ma, a favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nu'man bin Thabit. Al-Kufi, meaning because he was born in the city of Al-Kufa. Remember the city of Al-Kufa? was founded by Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu ta'ala anh, who had the city built. And many of the companions settled in the city of Al-Kufa, including Sayyiduna Ali, karamallahu wajahu al-kareem, and Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh. So because so many companions settled down in the city of Al-Kufa, the knowledge of those companions 
was left as an inheritance for the scholars of Al Kufa, Al Ulama Warathatul Anbiya, that the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. Ali Musalatu Wasalam. In the hadith narrated by Imam Al Bukhari and Al Imam Muslim, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and narrated by Imam Al Tabarani and others, that on the authority of Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud and other companions, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لو كان الإيمان عند ثريا لتناوله رجال من أبناء فارس which means that if Iman, faith and in one version not in Bukhari and Muslim in another version in Al-Tabarani the wording is لو كان العلم معلقا عند ثريا which means if knowledge was hinging or hanging in the Pleiades meaning as cluster of stars a, a set of stars that exist, uh, that if knowledge was in those stars, then men from the children of the Persians would have attained that knowledge. And the wording in the Sahih is uh, al-imanu, that if faith was in the Pleiades, then the men from the children of Faris would have attained this. Now from the history of Islam, from the companions Ali Muridwan, after the companions, until this day, there has never been a Persian who has attained what Al Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmallahu Ta'ala attained, excluding the companions. Meaning excluding the companions like Sayyiduna Salman al Farsi radiallahu an, some of the people, earlier generations, interpreted the hadith to mean Sayyiduna Salman al Farsi radiallahu an was from the companions. But later generations said this is in reference to Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, like the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an in the Jami of Al Imam Al Tirmidhi, relating to people Yushiku and Yadrib al Nasu Akbad al Ibli, Yatlubun al Ilma, Fala Yajiduna A'lama min Alim al Madinati, which means that it shall soon happen that people shall hit the sides of the camels, meaning the livers of the camels, literally, which means the sides of the camels, to travel in order to seek knowledge. فَلَا يَجِدُونَ They will not find anyone أَعْلَمَ مِنْ عَالِمِ الْمَدِينَةِ more learned than the scholar of al Madinatul Munawwara. So early generations thought this refers to Sayyiduna Abu Huraira radiallahu an, because he was the alim of al Madinatul Munawwara in narrating hadith. But later generations interpreted this regarding Al Imam Malik bin Anas radiallahu an, one of the four great Imams. And this hadith is narrated by Al Imam Tirmidhi. In the same way, the hadith, لا تسب قريشا فإن عالمها يملع الأرض علما. This hadith, some have tried declaring it weak, but Al Hafiz ibn Hajar al Makki, Al Haythami al Makki, rahimallah ta'ala, states that the hadith is acceptable and many others that the hadith means do not curse Quraysh because the alim of Quraysh, the learned one of Quraysh shall fill the earth with knowledge and the scholars say this refers to Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala who is al-Muttalibi meaning from the children of Abdul Muttalib he was from the descendants of Abdul Muttalib and was related to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam so these are three hadith which scholars have said refer to the three imams out of the four. Out of th three imams of the four. But of course we do not limit the number of imams in the early period to four imams. There were many imams. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that the four schools were the four schools that were preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we shall go on to this later as to what this refers to. So Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was born in Al-Kufa in Iraq, modern day Iraq. And during the rule of the Bani Umayyah, what do we mean by Banu Umayyah? Banu Umayyah is the rule of those people who ruled after Amir Muawiyah radiallahu an. So Amir Muawiyah passed away radiallahu an in the year 60. After which his son Yazid usurped the throne and enforced his rule until he pillaged and killed so many different people. And we know regarding the history of Karbala 
after usurping the throne and ruling, he passed away and then his son came onto the throne known as Muawiyah. He was known as Muawiyah as well, the same name as his grandfather, but he was not like his father Yazid. He passed away after he came off the throne and then the line of Muawiyah and the Sahabi was finished. After this, the rulers that came onto the throne became known as Banu Umayyah. And Sayyiduna Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was born during the rule of Banu Umayyah. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala as a young man, did he see any of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the narrators narrate like Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi rahimahullah ta'ala who is the student of Abu al-Abbas, Ahmed bin Taymiyyah, Al-Imam al-Dhahabi. He states that Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala saw, Malik bin, uh, uh, saw Anas bin Malik radiyallahu an, the companion. Sayyiduna Anas bin Malik radiyallahu an was the khadim, the servant of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam supplicated for him due to the supplication and the blessings of the supplication, Sayyiduna Anas radiallahu an lived into old age and he had over 80 children. Over 80 children. Uh, uh, that's from the boys alone. And so much wealth. When he came to Kuf, Al-Kufa, the city of Al-Kufa, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala saw him. What is established is that Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala definitely saw some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like Abu Tufail and uh, 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 Sayyiduna uh, Anas bin Malik radiallahu an and other companions. So Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi in his tariq Baghdad, Abu Bakr Ali bin Thabit al-Baghdadi, the author of uh, the tariq, the history, he mentions the names of the companions that Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala saw. Some of them, they are doubtful, but he definitely saw some of them. Therefore, he is counted from At-Tabi'een, meaning, who are the At-Tabi'oon? At-Tabi'oon are those people who are the successors of the companions. So the word At-Tabi'oon means successors. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ the best of centuries is my century. Then those who come after them, and then those who come after them, meaning the pious people from each generation who are known as as salafu salihun. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah ta'ala was from that generation known as at tabiun the successors. In his early life, apart from seeing some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was involved in trade. So he would deal in al-khaz, al-khaz, is a material which is made from fine cotton, which is a permitted material. He would deal in this material and he made so much money from this trade in his early youth, in his early years. But one day he passed by the masjid and in those days when scholars would teach, they would teach in the masjid and one of the scholars was standing outside of the masjid whose name was a Sha'bi. Al-Imam Sha'bi rahmatullahi alayhi, one of the famous Imams, he was standing and he saw this man passing by, a young man, when we say young, in his uh, late teens to early twenties. And he saw this young man and from the face, he could tell that this man is a man of knowledge. So he said to him, why have you not attended your lessons, thinking that this was one of his students, when he was informed by the young man that I am not one of your students and I, and I am not a student of knowledge, Al-Imam Al-Sha'bi ta'ala advised him to study, having firasa, firasa meaning being able to see the hallmarks of goodness. This is one of the uh, sciences uh, which is uh, known as physiognomy in English. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us regarding the nur, uh, the light of the believers, that the believers have uh, which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, told us in the hadith in, uh, narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, اِتَّقُوا فِرَاسَةَ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Fear the foresight or the insight of a believer because he 
witnesses with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Shabi was able to tell regarding this young man that this young man had the hallmarks of a very knowledgeable person. So after this, this statement of Imam Shabi rahimahullah ta'ala fell in the heart of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Now remember, the statements of great scholars like this were such that their statements would fall into the hearts of people. Why? Because they were people who practiced what they preached. So Imam Shabi rahimahullah ta'ala was practicing what he preached and that fell into the heart of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Later on, Imam al-Shafi'i, Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah would say, النَّاسُ عِيَالٌ عَلَىٰ فِقْهِ, على فقه أَبِي Hanifa." That people are dependent upon the jurisprudence of Abu Hanifa. Imagine the reward of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and all of that would fall under the sahifa, the scroll of Imam Shabi, Because Imam Shabi was the one who encouraged him to study. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala went to the Masjid of Al-Kufa. In those days, the scholars would have circles of knowledge in the Masajid. And he went and attended various circles of knowledge. In total, he ended up with over 4,000 shiuch. 4,000 shiuch means 4,000 teachers. He studied with 4,000 people. But his foremost teacher was Al-Imam Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, rahimahullah ta'ala. Al-Imam Hamad. Later on, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, would name his own son Hamad. So his teacher was Al-Imam Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman. What was the method of studying in those times and how did people study? Remember, in the times of the companions Ali Muridwan, the foremost knowledge which people studied was Al Quran Al Kareem. So people would memorize Al Quran Al Kareem and then the companions would memorize the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or from one another. Like this, Sayyiduna Abu Huraira radiallahu an was able to narrate over 800, 800 hadith. 800. Uh, Abdul Rahman ibn al Jawzi rahimullah in his book Talqih Fuhumi Ahl al Athar mentions the number of narrations narrated by each companion. After the time of the companions Ali Muridwan, or during that time also, some of the companions would e extract legal rulings from Al Quran Al Karim and from the Sunnah regarding those issues which were not decided upon. Regarding which issues? Those issues which were not decided upon. This is told by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith narrated by Imam Al Bukhari. Ida hakam al hakimu fa إذا حكم الحاكم فاجتهد ثم أصاب فله أجران that if a person meaning a hakim here meaning a mujtahid a person who is able to deduce rulings if he exerts his effort and he is correct he shall have two rewards he shall have two rewards and also وإذا حكم الحاكم فَاجْتَهَدَ ثُمَّ أَخْطَأَ فَلَهُ أَجْرٌ That if he exerts his efforts and he is wrong, then he shall have one reward. This hadith in Al-Bukhari tells us that there are certain issues in the Sharia which have not been made explicit, that have been left for people who are qualified to decide upon. So the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not play, pray Zuhr prayer, do not pray the afternoon prayer, illa fi Bani Qurayza, except when you reach Banu Qurayza, meaning the fortress. So the companions went, when they went, some of them interpreted this statement to mean that we shall pray on the way, because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant rush, hurry to Banu Qurayza. Another group took the statement literally and they said we shall not pray dhuhr except once we reach Banu Qurayza. 
When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was for, was told regarding this, he did not tell off any one of the two groups. So these are issues of ijtihad that if the mujtahid prefers one opinion and he is correct, he shall have two rewards. And if he goes with the other opinion, he shall have one reward. Al-Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman al-Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala and Al-Imam Ahmad bin Hajar al-Haytami al-Makki rahimahullah ta'ala they say the meaning of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left a leeway in the sharia, in the law for the mujtahid to decide. If he chooses the correct position, then he shall have two rewards. But the other position is not incorrect. It is the less better position. So how they interpret the hadith is that the one who shall have two rewards, his position is better. And the one who chooses the other position, his position is inferior but not incorrect. This is how they interpret the hadith. This leeway which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa left was in contrast to the Sharia of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam. In the Sharia of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam, there was no permissibility for any difference of opinion. So in the Sharia of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam, if scholars differed over something, there was only one correct judgment. And if they went against that correct judgment, they would be punished. But in this ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left so much mercy that we were given sab'atu ahruf. Seven ahruf meaning seven ways of reciting the Quran which are contained within the 10 to 14 qira'at. The seven ahruf. And in the same way, a difference of opinion in those issues which are issues of ijtihad. So, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmallahu ta'ala was born in an era where scholars were still compiling all the issues of subsidiary disputes. I mean these type of disputes, not the type of disputes where there is no difference of opinion. Meaning, every Muslim knows alcohol is haram. Every Muslim knows zina is haram, fornication is haram. These are not issues of ijtihad. But the issues of ijtihad are those things which the scholars differed. So in the time of the tabi'een, the scholars were recording the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if someone wanted a verdict, a fatwa, they may go to the masjid and they will find a circle of hadith, people relating hadith, but they will ask the fatwa, a verdict, and most of the people there will not be able to give them an answer. Why? Because only very few people were able to extract legal rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. So much so that in the times of the, the time of the companions, Ali Muridwan, there were around 20 companions from 110,000 who would only give verdicts, who would extract legal rulings directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. We are not referring to those legal rulings which were explicit in the Quran and Sunnah. Those legal rulings were people could not infer the rulings directly from the Quran and Sunnah. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, when he sat in the circle of Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, Imam Hamad rahimahullah ta'ala started the compilation of the fiqh jurisprudence, meaning in accordance with the chapters. So you would have Kitab al-Tahara, the chapter of purification, Kitab al-Salah, Kitab al saum Kitab al-Hajj, Kitab al-Zakat, like this every chapter of jurisprudence. And he would extract the masail, the questions directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was able to learn this science from Imam Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman. What knowledge did, it, did this entail? This entailed knowledge of the Quran and the qiraat, the recitations of the Quran. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala learned the qiraat of the Quran from Imam Asim. So qiraatul Qira'atu Hafs is from An Asim. So uh, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala learned the qira'at from Imam Asim. And he would recite with this qira'at. He memorized a hadith that some people attempt to criticize the knowledge of hadith of Imam Abu Hanifa. This is only because Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala 
did not give as much attention to narrating hadith as much as he did to extracting masail questions from the hadith. Meaning most of his efforts were in extracting the masail, the questions from the hadith directly and compiling the questions, meaning the masail, which are the answers to people's problems in, in book form, meaning dictating this to his students. This is why later, Alima Muhammad al-Shaybani, rahimahullah ta'ala, was able to compile books like Kitab al-Athar, al-Jami' al-Saghir, al-Jami' al-Kabir, al-Ziyadat, al-Mabsut, these books, what did he do in those books? He wrote down all the statements he could uh, regarding what Al-Imam Abu Hanifa said. This is how we know when we say Al-Imam Abu Hanifa said this, this was compiled by his student Al-Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani rahimahullah ta'ala, who was from Raqqa in modern day Syria. He was originally from Syria, from Raqqa. He came to study with Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah as a child. And then later when Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah passed away, then Al-Imam Ya'qub bin Ibrahim, Al-Imam Abu Yusuf, his name is Ya'qub bin Ibrahim, taught Al-Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani rahimahullah. So when Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was in the circle of Al-Imam Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, he learned the Quran, the Ahadith, and the method of extracting the legal rulings directly from the Quran and Hadith. Now a scholar who does this is known as Mujtahid Mustaqil, meaning a scholar who is a mujtahid is a person who can formulate by studying the Quran and studying the Hadith, he can formulate the, the legal maxims or the legal principles from which, which are the tools and the instruments to extract the legal rulings. This type of mujtahid is known as mujtahid mustaqil, meaning an independent mujtahid, a person who can study the Quran and tell us <clears throat> what legal theory he employs in order to extract those, legal, uh, those rulings from the Quran and the Hadith. The first person to write down on the legal theory was Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah was born in the year 150, the same year that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah passed away. And he was a student of, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. So he studied with Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. And he also studied with Imam Malik bin Anas. Remember Imam Malik, rahimahullah, was a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa. He was 10 years younger than Imam Abu Hanifa because he was born after 90 Hijrah, around that time, in al madinatul Munawwara. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, compiled the Muatta and... Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah was the first person to write down the legal theory, the method of extract, which we know as usul al-fiqh, in his famous book known as al-Risala. So his book al-Risala was one of the earliest books to be written on this subject. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah did not write down his legal theory, the method. But later scholars like Abu Zayd al-Dabusi, they compiled the legal theory of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala in book form by studying the subsidiary issues which Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah had extracted. Now, during one time, Imam Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, and this was in the early 100s in Islamic history, traveled to another city and he left behind Imam Abu Hanifa. While he was gone for two months, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was asked 60 questions. When Al-Imam Hamad returned, Al-Imam Hamad asked him, what questions were you asked? Inquired, what questions were you asked? Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah mentioned the 60 questions. Al-Imam Hamad accepted 40 of the answers and corrected him on 20 of the answers. After this, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah stayed with Al-Imam Hamad until, until Al-Imam Hamad passed away. Meaning learning the legal theory and the method in extracting legal rulings direct, directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. After Al-Imam Hamad passed away, the students of Al-Imam Hamad wanted someone to replace him. So they attempted to replace Al-Imam Hamad with his son. But his son 
was an expert in language. He had fields of expertise. Like this, they went to different students of Imam Hamad. The one they were most satisfied with was Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man bin Thabit, rahimallahu ta'ala. So Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimallah, sat in the Masjid of Al-Kufa until, his, until the days of his passing away until he was martyred. So uh, many people are unfamiliar with the fact that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was martyred, but also went through trials with the government of the time. For instance, in the year 130, just a year or two before the Banu, Ab- Banu Umayyah rule finished, because after them, the Banu Abbas came into power. The Wali, who was the governor of Iraq, he demanded from Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, at the behest of the ruler at the time that he become the judge. The judge of Baghdad, meaning the chief justice of Baghdad. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, refused. They kept him in prison for 10 days and every day they would lash him 10 times. After Imam Abu Hanifa refused, when he was released, he went to Makkah al mukarrama and stayed in Makkah al mukarrama until the Banu Abbas rule was finished. They were overthrown, uh, the Banu Umayyah rule was overthrown by the Banu Abbas. When Imam Abu Hanifa returned back to Al-Kufa, the Banu Abbas were ruling the Muslim world at that time. So he went through different trials. But Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, continued teaching in the Masjid of Al-Kufa. One of the titles of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, was Al-Watad. Al-Watad was a pole. Why was he known as the pole? Because all night he would stand up worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For over 40 years, people observed him worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How would they observe? After the Fajr prayer, he would sit in the masjid teaching until Dhuhr prayer. And then after Dhuhr prayer, he would stay in the masjid teaching. After Asr prayer, up until Asr prayer. After Asr prayer, he would stay in the masjid teaching until Maghrib prayer. After Maghrib prayer, he would stay in the masjid teaching until Isha prayer. Then at Isha time, when the number of people would reduce, the person who reports this, his own student, states that I stayed with him. And then throughout the night, he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the Fajr prayer again. And he followed him like this for three days. And he says that the routine, he had kept the same for three days. They also mentioned regarding him that during the day, he was not seen doing iftar except a light meal. A very light meal. And in the same way, one, uh, one of his wives states that the only time he would sleep was after dhuhr, after the after, afternoon prayer. Meaning if someone would know, it would be the people of the household. His wife states that he would only sleep for a short amount of time after dhuhr prayer and that was when the heat would become intense. And his meal was very light. So for over 40 years, people observed this from Imam Abu Hanifa rahimallah ta'ala. This is why he was known as Al-Watad, meaning the pole, because the neighbors would observe him sometimes in the garden, standing up all night, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, what they mentioned regarding him when he went to Makkah al mukarrama whenever people would go to the Mataf, the place where the people circumambulate the Kaaba, Whenever they would go to the Mataf, they would see Sufyan Thawri. Was a, Imam Sufyan Thawri was a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa. He had his own school of thought. And Imam Abu Hanifa, these two were the only ones observed during the Mataf in the heat of Makkah al mukarrama And whenever people would go to the Mataf, they would observe them. Meaning whenever they would visit Makkah al mukarrama Sufyan Thawri rahimullah ta'ala was from Al-Kufa, was a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa. As well as Al-Imam Sufyan bin Uyayna. Al-Imam Sufyan, these two are known as Sufyanain, the two Sufyans. Al-Imam Sufyan bin Uyayna was from the Hijaz, from Makkah al mukarrama And when people would want advice who to narrate hadith from, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa 
Rahimallah was, Rahimallah was one of those who would advise people who to go to and what hadith to take from them. Even great imams like Al-Imam Al-A'mash was witnessed carrying Kitab rahan of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. What is Kitab rahan Kitab rahan is the, the legal rulings relating to collateral, meaning if you leave uh, uh, something as an insurance with someone, what are the legal rulings relating to that? So Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, would dictate the legal rulings to his students. The students compiled this in a Kitab rahan and a great Imam like Al-Imam Al-A'mash was witness carrying the book of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa and studying from it. And this is why Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, ta'ala, said that anyone who does not study the works of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, will never attain jurisprudence, will never attain an understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. Al-Imam Al-A'mash as well as other Imams testified to the greatness of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. One of those was Al-Imam Abd Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak rahimahullah ta'ala was a student of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. And when people attempted to disparage Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala in his lifetime because he had many people who were envious of him, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak would say to them, this is the scholar who I studied fiqh, jurisprudence, and he would praise Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. One of the students of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala was Fudayl bin Iyad. Fudayl bin Iyad rahimahullah was the one who was a former highway bandit. His story is famous. He would uh, rob people on the road and then he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and became one of the greatest ascetics of his time. One of the greatest worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As well as Al-Imam Dawud al-Ta'i. Al-Imam Dawud al-Ta'i was also one of the students of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah had one of the largest circles of students in the Muslim world in his lifetime. So many Muslims were influenced by him in his lifetime. And no one can say his school spread through government and politics. Why? Because he was killed and martyred by the Caliph Al-Mansur, who was the Caliph of the Banu Abbas. He had Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah ta'ala martyred. What they mention in the year 150, he, he had the food of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah poisoned. And Al-Imam Abu Hanifa said, I know what you have placed in this food. I will not eat it because suicide is haram. So they forced some of the food into the mouth of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and he passed away due to poisoning as well as the effects of the lashing. The reason behind this was because he refused to become the chief justice, the chief judge for the Banu Abbas. Why did he refuse? Because he said, you commit so many atrocities that I refuse to sign the blood of Muslims. Meaning, when they would carry out uh, executions, he, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa was saying that he would refuse to sign the uh, execution of any Muslim. But there was also an agenda behind this, which was the support Imam Abu Hanifa Taala had and the loyalty he had for some of the members of the Alul Bayt who revolted against the Banu Abbas. Because they knew Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Taala had loyalties to them, the agenda behind the martyrdom of Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Taala was, was to stop the support because Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was a man of wealth. And all his wealth was from trade. He traded in the cloth, in a, a cotton cloth all his life, and he earned money that every year he would send so much wealth to Baghdad. He said, any surplus wealth I earn, I send to the ulama. That wealth then would be distributed amongst the scholars of Baghdad and the muhaddithin of Baghdad. They would distribute all that wealth amongst the scholars of Baghdad. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah said, I would not keep with me anything more than 4,000 di dirhams. 4,000 dirhams. Why? Because according to one narration of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, narrated by Imam Abdul Razak in his Musannaf, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an states that, the, that anyone who has up to 4,000 dirhams, which is 4,000 silver coins, a maximum wealth would not be considered as being 
extravagant, meaning anything that exceeds this would be considered as extravagant. Based upon this statement of Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, when he would earn extra wealth, he would send that to Baghdad, to the circles of scholars, and he would give the scholars the money that they needed. Every student who came to study under Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was made rich. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, would give them an allowance and they would uh, pay for their costs and they would study with the Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. So th- the, these were some of the personal aspects of the lifestyle of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. But what was the hallmarks of his school? Meaning the school of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, what were the principles of his school? Firstly, all the legal rulings of his school were based upon Al-Qur'anul Kareem. Then the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Ijma', the consensus, and after this Qiyas, which was analogy. When Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimullah could not find anything relating to an issue in an explicit verse of the Qur'an, he would refer to the Sunnah. If he did not find the question in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would look in the statements of the companions Ali Muridwan. If he did not find anything within the statements of the companions Ali Muridwan, then he would exert his own effort in deducing the ruling from the Quran and the sunnah directly. This was his methodology. But Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah gave preference to weak hadith over his own opinion. For instance, in the Hanafi school, there is a legal ruling that if a person is praying, and while praying, if they laugh out aloud, then their prayer and their ablution is invalidated. If we were to use Qiyas analogy, then this ruling would... Uh, would not stand. Why? Because there is no hadith, meaning impurity coming out of the person. But Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah ta'ala based this on a weak hadith narrated by Al-Imam Al-Daraqutni that while the companions were praying behind the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course, when the hadith reached Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, it did not reach him in the sunan of Al-Daraqutni. This is something to remember. Because the sunan of Al-Daraqutni was recorded later. So the chains that reached Al-Imam Abu Hanifa were from different scholars of hadith. The blind man fell into the well and the, some of the companions laughed out aloud. After the Messenger of Allah وسلم, completed the prayer, he ordered the people who laughed out aloud to, to renew their ablution and their prayer. Based upon this, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa gave the legal ruling that anyone who laughs out aloud in prayer must renew their ablution. But the hadith is weak. But he preferred the weak hadith over his own opinion. So like this, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah compiled Abu fiqh These are known as subsidiary issues of fiqh known as furu' Recorded later by Al-Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, then later scholars within the school, like Al-Imam al-Quduri rahimullah was from Baghdad, and why was he called Al-Quduri? Because he would, he was, his uh, occupation was from, or his family occupation was from making pots. The uh, Qudur is plural of Qidr. They would make pots, so he became known as Al-Quduri. And he wrote a famous book known as Mukhtasarul Quduri. These type of books were based upon the legal theory on how to extract rulings from the Quran and Sunnah. After Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah ta'ala passed away, this became known as the Hanafi school of thought. Like this, the schools of the other Imams like Al-Imam Malik rahimullah became known as the Maliki school. The school of Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimullah became known as the Shafi'i school. The school of Al-Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal became known as the Hanbali school. But there were other schools like the school of Al-Layf bin Sa'ad who was from Egypt, the one who debated Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah. And when he debated Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Malik started to sweat. And Al-Imam Layth said to him, 
you are sweating. And Imam Malik said, I am not sweating debating you, O Egyptian, because he was from Egypt. He said, if you wanted to see me sweat, you should have observed me when I was debating Abu Hanifa. And regarding Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Imam Malik said that he was such a man that if he wanted to prove this pillar to be made from gold with his reasoning, he would be able to do so. So later on, these schools formulated like the school of Al-Layth bin Sa'ad, also the, Ima- the school of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, and the school of Imam Zay- uh, Zayd, all these were schools of different a'imma. But what was the distinction of the four schools? The distinction of the four schools was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed that only these four schools were preserved in which way? The legal theory and the legal method in how they extracted the legal rulings was preserved. Meaning, if someone reads Alam al of Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah and they find Ibn Qayyim quoting Sufyan al or Al-Imam Al-Layth bin Sa'ad, or different scholars and their verdicts, is it permissible for a person to give a fatwa according to the statement of those imams? The answer would be no. Why would it not be permissible? Because we do not know the methodology that was used by those imams in extracting that legal ruling. The only schools that have preserved the methodology are these four Sunni schools. And apart from preserving the methodology, the chains of narrations back to those imams has been, has been preserved. So if someone states that uh, Al-Imam Al-Layth bin Sa'ad stated this, the chain of narration back to Al-Imam Al-Layth bin Sa'ad is not preserved in all cases. Meaning many of the times it may be quoted in a book because Ibn Qayyim lived in the 8th century, meaning in the 700s. He passed away in the 700s. He was a student of Abu Abbas Ahmad bin Taymiyyah. He may quote Al-Layth bin Sa'ad, but do we have direct reference to Imam Al-Layth bin Sa'ad? The answer is no. Unlike the Hanafi school, the opinions of Imam Abu Hanifa were recorded by Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani and Imam Abu Yusuf, Ya'qub bin Ibrahim. And the opinions of Imam Malik were preserved in Al-Mudawwana and his own works of the Muatta and other people who narrated from him. The opinions of Imam Shafi'i were preserved by his student Al-Muzani and Al-Buwaiti. Al-Muzani was the maternal uncle of Imam Abu Ja'far Al-Tahawi. Al-Muzani, who's the student of Imam Shafi'i, he was the foremost student of Imam Shafi'i. He's, he, he is the uncle of Imam Al-Tahawi, who's one of the greatest Hanafi scholars. So when we read Al-Aqidah to Tahawiyah, that Al-Aqidah to Tahawiyah is by the nephew of Imam Al-Muzani, who is the the main student of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. And like this, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, his opinions were recorded by his students. So like this, the opinions of the four Imams have been preserved as well as their legal theory and their methodology. So when a fatwa appears, a modern fatwa, which people ask regarding, meaning so many modern issues like organ transplant and different issues which people ask, The four schools have a methodology, a fixed methodology of how to extract a legal ruling even if the issue is new. So a modern issue, like if someone traveled to the moon, would they have to pray their five daily prayers on the moon? This would not confuse a mufti from the four schools. Why? Because they have a legal theory, a method of extracting the rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. But the other schools, they have not preserved this. Someone may say, why is the school of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq invalid today? The answer is that the school of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq as made by the claimants today is not the school of Imam Ja'far radiallahu an. It is the school of the Rawafid, meaning the Rawafid rejected the, they accepted some of the Imams of the Alul Bayt and rejected other Imams a'imma of Alul Bayt. So, the school of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq has been tampered. In the same way, all the other schools have been tampered. The only schools that have been preserved are these four schools. Someone may say, 
Is it not, is it not possible for us today to do ijtihad, to become mujtahid mustaqil? The answer is, if you want to become a mujtahid mustaqil, then when you formulate your own principles, you will realize that you cannot go out of the principles of the four schools. Meaning, if there is a general statement in the Qur'an, can we specify that general statement of the Qur'an with one hadith? This is a question in legal theory. So, the majority of the scholars will say, yes, you can. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala said, you cannot. This is why if someone quotes a hadith to a Hanafi, one hadith, and they say the hadith is in Al-Bukhari, why did Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah not practice that hadith? Because his legal theory is that a one hadith cannot specify a general statement of the Qur'an or the Sunnah. This is a principle. Now if a mujtahid came along today, a new mujtahid, he would not be able to make a new principle. He would have to either follow the principle of the majority or the principle of Imam Abu Hanifa. When he decides to follow any one of the two principles, or if he formulates the principle, he would have to only formulate one of these two principles. When he makes rulings based upon this principle, whichever one of the two he follows, his rulings would automatically fit into the same rulings of the schools. So if he followed the principle of the majority, his rulings would become the rulings of the majority. And if he followed the principle of Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimallah ta'ala, then his rulings would be similar to the rulings of Imam Abu Hanifa. This is why great scholars who had the, the ability to be mujtahid mustaqil, like Imam Nawawi, Rahimallah, Yahya bin Sharaf, Al-Nawawi, or Imam Taqiyuddin Subki, or Imam Tajuddin Subki, or Imam Jalaluddin Abdul Rahman Suyuti, never left the Shafi'i school. Why? Because they had the ability, but they realized <coughs> that we agree with the Imam on all these issues. This is why going out of the four schools today would be impermissible. Read Rushi. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> we come on to an issue which is in today's day and age people abandon the four schools in two ways. One method is going directly to the Quran and Sunnah in order to extract rulings. And the second method <clears throat> is by mixing and matching the principles of all four schools and other schools and making rulings which, are, which they term as fiqh taysir which is making things easy for people. What is the problem with both of these methodologies? The foremost proponent of the first methodology in our times was Nasiruddin al-Albani. He wrote a book called Sifatu Salat al-Nabi, a description of the Prophet's prayer described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this book, he compiled a hadith describing the prayer of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, giving the impression that for over 1200 years, the four schools have had not had the correct method of praying. So he formulated a new method of praying, which is observed today in some of the masajid and also in large segments of the Middle East, that where people will stand in a, in a way, in a method that does not fall into any one of the methods of praying according to the four schools. So when they would spread their legs far, away, far apart, some of them spread their legs so far apart in order to stand feet to feet and shoulder to shoulder, the lack of fiqh jurisprudence is such that when they stand alone, they also stand with their legs far apart. So standing in, in congregation when you stand with your legs so far apart in order to join the feet with the feet is understandable. But when you stand alone, where do you get this legal ruling to stand with your feet so far apart? There is no such hadith. In the same way, when they stand feet to feet in the congregation, 
some of them spread their legs so far apart that the shoulders no longer touch. If you notice, they spread the feet so far apart that the shoulders will not touch. This method of praying was innovated by Nasiruddin al-Albani in his book Sifatu Salat in Nabi where he opposed the four schools. In that book he criticized the scholars of the four schools saying that when they write their books they do not place proof and evidence which is not true. There are books of the four schools where they will give proof and evidence. But when they write for the common people, they just write the method of praying because not everyone is able to go through the proofs and evidences. Later on, after a few years, he himself summarized his own work, took out all the ahadith and said, I compiled this book without the proofs and evidences for people to recite so they may read the book very quickly. So he ended up formulating his own school of thought in Jordan. He was originally from Albania. He migrated <clears throat> with his father, who was a Hanafi scholar, to Damascus. Then he was exiled. He went to Saudi Arabia. Then he was exiled from Saudi Arabia and settled in Jordan. And he, he has an international following of people who follow this book, Sifatu Salat in Nabi. In the Indian subcontinent, we had this movement of the Ghair Muqallideen, the people who refused to follow one of the four schools. They had people like Sadiq Hassan Khan, <clears throat> but many others. Uh, like Nadir Dahlawi and so many others that they attacked the four schools claiming that the four schools do not follow the Quran and the Sunnah and that they follow the Quran and the Sunnah and they follow the uh, Salafu Salih and the pious predecessors but in reality if someone studies the four schools he will realize that the real Salafia the real people who followed a Salafu Salih are the the, the scholars of the four, uh, four schools, meaning the ulama of the four schools. So this was one of the illnesses or plagues in our times that people claimed you can go directly into Quran and Sunnah and extract rulings. If this was the case, then so many of them when they read Ilmul Mirath, knowledge of inheritance laws, they would not go and use works of the Shafi'i school like Sharh al Rahabiya or the school of uh, the works of the Hanafi school like a Siraji in order to understand Ilmul Mirath inheritance laws which is one of the most difficult chapters of uh, fiqh of jurisprudence let me tell you a story of Al Imam Abu Hanifa rahmallahu ta'ala and his superlative excellent intelligence once a woman came to him and she said my father left 600 dinar, 600 gold coins, and I have only been given one dinar in inheritance. So her father passed away. She said, I have only inherited one gold coin, one dinar. Straight away, straight away, Al Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, told her the mas'ala. He said, Your father passed away, he left a wife. He left a mother, he left 12 sons, and one daughter, straight away. Now, what does each one get? Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, and to the, uh, the, the mas'ala actually was, the woman came and she said, "My, uh, when, when he mentioned this, what Al-Imam Abu Hanifa calculated straight away, that the wife gets one-eighth. The mother gets one-sixth. And the brothers, uh, what they term as Asaba, and she was a sister, sorry. So the Mas'ala was like this, that my brother passed away and he left inheritance and he left a wife, he left two daughters, they get two-thirds. So two-thirds with one-sixth and one-eighth was for one-eighth was for the wife, one-sixth was for the mother, and two-thirds were for the two daughters. The remainder, which was for 12 brothers and one sister, was for, the remainder was for them. From that, she would only receive one gold coin. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahmallah, calculated this straight away. This is very difficult to do. 
This was the intelligence of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah. Who was he following like this? Sayyiduna Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an. If you read uh, Ilmul Mirath, they mention in Ilmul Mirath that Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an was standing on the member and a man came in and asked Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu an a mas'ala of Ilmul Mirath. When he asked the mas'ala, Al-Imam Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an was able to answer the question straight away. That mas'ala became known as Al-Mas'alatul Mimbariya, the pulpit question. I think the question was, he left a mother, a father, and two daughters, and a wife. And the mas'ala is extracted from 27. I think the mas'ala is like this. So how intelligent were these imams? that they compiled <coughs> works extracting these rulings from the Qur'an and Sunnah. Now, if a person feels that these four Imams did not follow Qur'an and Sunnah or their legal rulings in their schools were not based on Qur'an and Sunnah, or they believe Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimullah, his rulings were not from, al- from Al-Qur'an, al Karim or the Sunnah, then they are free to follow the other Imam. So, what reason do they have to leaving and abandoning all four schools. Meaning, if a person follows Al-Imam Shafi'i, Rahimallah Ta'ala, believing Al-Imam Shafi'i followed the Quran and Sunnah, or Al-Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, or Al-Imam Malik, or Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, what reason is given to these people for abandoning all four schools? Anyone who abandons all four schools, you will notice they will not have a legal theory of how to extract the rulings from the Quran and Sunnah. Like, a Sayyid Sabiq, the author of Fiqh Sunnah, he compiled a book claiming that he will give proof for every mas'ala in that book from the Quran and the Sunnah. He starts off with, uh, with the ibadat, the acts of worship, and mainly he copies from Nailul Autar of Muhammad bin Ali al Shawkani. Shawkani, who passed away in the year 1255, was also from those people who claim to be from the Mujtahideen, the people who could do ijtihad for themselves. So this author, a Sayyid Sabiq from Egypt, he copies from uh, Nailul Autar, but when he goes into the more detailed chapters of fiqh, the book becomes very weak, meaning he may quote one hadith or two hadith, and he's unable to give a, a, a deep fiqh. But when you check the books of the four schools, they go into detail regarding every issue. How are they able to extract these masail? Because they had a correct legal theory. Now, the second group which is mistaken in extracting legal rulings is the group which is claiming to follow all of the schools and mixing and matching them in such a way that they say, we make things easy for people. But what mistake they fall into is that at one point they will follow the principle of one school but give the subsidiary ruling from another school. Or they will give a subsidiary ruling from one school and follow the legal and contradict the legal theory of that school. If someone is to give a fatwa, he must follow, follow the legal theory of one mujtahid mustaqil, independent mujtahid, and the legal rulings that follow from that rule. Meaning there must be a consistency in the fatwa. Of course, there are times when the scholars give fatwa according to the other schools, but they do so based upon certain principles. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the four imams and all the scholars of the salaf, as salafu salihun, regarding whom the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ Bless them and enable the ummah to return back to the teachings of the four imams and the, the way of as-salafu salihun aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa atubu ilayh